Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our final Premier Pulse virtual series session for Lendl's. Over the last month and a half, SPG has shared extension information virtually for all Pulse crops. For Pulse crops. Uh, these virtual sessions have been an opportunity to take the Winter Pulse meetings online. My name is Sean Deerland, and I'm chair with the Saskatchewan Pulse Growers Board of Directors, and I farm at Kyle. I'll be your host for the meetings today. Lastly, I want to thank today's session sponsor, Bayer Crop Science. Uh, thank you, Bayer Crop Science, for your sponsorship today. I'd like to call on Carl Potts, Executive Director with SPG, to bring some welcome remarks before we start the sessions. Good morning and welcome, Carl. Good morning, everybody. I'll just get my slides put up here. Okay, well, uh, thank you everyone for, uh, for joining here this morning. Um, and thanks, Sean, for the uh, introduction. In increasing yields of established pulse crops is an important uh, uh, component of SPG's R&D strategy. The on-farm yields come from continued enhancement of genetic yield potential and from reducing agronomic constraints. In order to support yield potential, we must invest in furthering genetics to undertake work in reducing the impact of weeds and diseases. And SPG is supporting these efforts for lentils through a number of major strategies and investments. SPG has recently refreshed our R&D strategy that guides our work and investments that we make in research and now includes a more intentional focus on the biggest issues for growers. This strategy includes the mitigation of root rots in peas and lentils, the development of uh, new herbicide tolerance platforms in lentils as well. These are key priorities for SPG as we explore new partnerships and new opportunities in breeding moving forward, where goals will be to offer grower solutions to root rots and herbicide tolerance for lentils through improved traits, and improve varieties and ensuring a return on investment for growers through that process. New breeding partnerships are complemented by new breeding funding that was recently announced for the University of Saskatchewan Crop Development Center for pea, chickpea, and dry bean breeding. SPG's R&D strategy also focuses in the shorter term on getting the right genetics in the right place around the province and determining and communicating the best agronomic practices for Saskatchewan pulses with an emphasis on weeds, disease, fertility, seeding rates, rotations, and harvest timing. Good R&D is important, but equally as, as important as getting this information to you, the growers looking to adopt these practices. So we've shifted our communication strategy over the past couple of years and have uh, expanded our resource library of relevant agronomic information. And we've also expanded the tools and ways in which we share that information with you. Adopting new technologies and tools has brought information to growers and agronomists through webinars to dive deeper into technical information, to a new podcast called Pulse of the Prairies, where you can listen to information in your vehicle, in the field, or really anywhere in between. By moving to a digital delivery of information, we're now able to communicate with you more frequently, at least every couple of weeks, and result, resulting in smaller, more bite-sized doses of relevant and timely delivery of key information. Finally, we know that we can't simply produce more lentils. It's also essential that we develop and diversify global markets and end-use opportunities in order to keep Saskatchewan growers profitable. Lentils and lentil ingredients are a major focus of our national market development strategy for pulses being led by SPG and by Pulse Canada. And some of the highlights of the strategy include building capacity of lentil processing in Canada. Diversification of end uses for lentils includes work in, on manufacturing and innovation of lentil flour and protein into cereal-based foods, batters and breadings, meat applications, meat and dairy alternatives, and bakery items. Whole lentils are also a, a part of the food service outreach strategy targeted to the US looking to increase consumption of lentils in restaurant and institutional dining menus. We've seen a recent success in the US restaurant uh, chain Be Good by adding new, a new Mediterranean bowl to their core menu featuring red lentils as, a, as directly as an outcome of a partnership and a collaboration with our market development team, so we're quite, quite proud of that. 
And I think a, a great example of the importance of these longer term market development efforts is the growth of the market uh, for Canadian peas in China over time. China is currently the largest market for Canadian peas, far surpassing the volumes once shipped to India. In fact, exports to China have grown 500% over the last 10 years. Building the Chinese market was a priority of market development efforts for the last 15 years, and the Canadian industry worked extensively on increasing interest and demand for peas and, and pea ingredients for use in staple foods and as a feed ingredient. So seeing the results of these efforts underscores the importance of this long-term targeted work in market development. We make investments today, in many cases, uh, with benefits five and, uh, and 10 years down the road. So we have a long time horizon on, on those things. So as we kick off our final 2021 pre Premier Pulse virtual series session today, specifically focused on lentils, we're thankful for the opportunity to still connect with growers and agronomists virtually this year. We do look forward to continuing uh, uh, in the future and connecting and offering extension and networking opportunities in person when we're able to do that. But I'm confident that you'll gain some powerful insights today and valuable information uh, for your, uh, your farming operation. And uh, we thank you very much for joining us here today. Back to you, Sean. Okay, thanks, Carl. Uh, thanks for the update. It's good to hear about SPG's forward plans for lentil breeding, R&D investment, and some of the uh, tools and market development plans to promote lentils. Our first presenter this morning is Dr. Sean Sharp. Sean is going to share some of his research and experience managing weeds and pulses. Addressing barriers like weeds, diseases, and insects is a huge part of SPG's refresh uh, research strategy and investment into research programs and breeding moving forward. Sean Sharp is a research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, focusing on weed science. Dr. Sharp's research, research focus involves herbicides, weed ecology, precision agriculture, and integrated uh, weed management. Uh, take it away, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Um, is my screen okay? Yeah, it looks great. Excellent, thank you very much. So again, my name is Sean Sharp, and I thank you for the opportunity to talk to you folks today. Um, so as a quick topic overview, I'll start by addressing prevention, particularly associated with herbicide resistance and the role of the soil seed bank. Then we'll cover physical control strategies, expectations on soil, residual herbicides, options, and insights from organic research, and end on an observation from a long-term rotation study. The soil seed bank is an important weed management consideration as it's a fairly persistent source of infestation within the agricultural fields. And by the soil seed bank, I mean the natural storage of weed seeds and other propagules for, for perennials that are going to occur in our soils. So I want to start from a historical perspective. This graph is from an 18 year rotational study that was conducted at Scott, Saskatchewan. While lentil production itself wasn't included in the study, it was a a long-term study that used many of our conventional strategies, including reduced tillage and a diversified annual grain rotation that included pulses. The D panel is for organic production, while the E panel is for no-till production with reduced inputs, and these Reduced inputs refer to using weed thresholds to help make decisions on spraying herbicides for weed management. The y-axis is weed densities, that is the number of plants per square meter, and note that this has been transformed, so it's really pushed down these numbers in this transformation and the x-axis is years. And over this 18-year study in both organic and 
reduced input systems um, that use a diversified annual grain rotation, uh, we do see an increase in weeds over time. And that means that we're getting an increase in weed emergence from the soil seed bank over time. And this increase in weed populations is likely due to um, our current weed management considerations primarily occurring around the critical period for weed control. So on the screen is the work which demonstrated the critical period for weed control in lentils, which occurs between the five and 10 node stage. And this is very early in the crop life cycle. And we do have some weeds that are emerging later. And if these weeds are left uncontrolled, then they're able to reproduce and replenish the, the soil seed bank. So what I'm going to propose is that on top of our considerations at the critical period for weed control to protect to protect the yield of our of our crop that we extend our considerations out uh, to the entire crop to look at stopping weeds from reproducing and this is to preserve the integrity of our available herbicides and Reducing weed populations are, are critical because every weed has an opportunity to become resistant. Resistance risk is accumulated with every weed that is killed by that mode of action. So for example, if we're spraying glyphosate preceding, every uh, plan has a chance to live. So every plan has an amount of risk associated with it. And we accumulate risk with every plant that we have to kill in that field. So this is why rotating modes of action is important because it's effectively resetting our, our risk counter um, towards a new mode of action. So if we're able to reduce the soil seed bank and stop the number of weeds that are emerging, we'll be effectively um, reducing the risk of herbicide resistance evolution. So again, what I'm advocating is that we take our weed control considerations a step past sp spray th thresholds towards reducing the seed return to the soil seed bank. These considerations are species specific and informed by the nature of our target weeds to propose the longevity of our available herbicides. And if we are able to reduce the soil seed bank, we will be able to eventually spray less as there's gonna be less weeds to kill as well. The soil seed bank is a persistent weed issue uh, and we want to be having it either static or preferably declining over time. So with that in mind, we'll begin to look at some physical IPM control, st control strategies to help stop seeds from going back into the soil. So I wanna start by highlighting the Harrington Seed Destructor. This is work conducted by Dr. Brian Tideman, who is currently at AFC in Alberta. And the Harrington Seed Destructor is a cage mill that is either pulled behind the combine or may be installed in behind the combine. And chaff is fed from the combine into the cage mill where it, as well as the weed seed within, is ground to a fine powder and then it's ejected back into the field. It is most effective on weeds that retain their seed at harvest. So it's not gonna be effective if the seed is on the ground. Um, the first panel is showing the efficacy of this technology on various problem, problematic weeds that are on the prairies. 
the y-axis is control, and please note it starts at 95%, so it's very effective. The x-axis is the various species, including kochia, green foxtail, false cleavers, volunteer canola, and wild oat, and all of these species are showing at least 97% control of those seeds that were put through the cage mill. On the second panel, we have the effect of various types of chaff. Um, this was in Alberta, so they tested peas, canola, and barley, and they were able to show that they had consistent control across these different types of crop chaff. A second option for preventing weeds from returning seed to the soil seed bank is by mowing. The strategy is most effective along the field edges where a crop may be less competitive and weeds may be more abundant, as well as around sloughs, tree lines, or, or windbreaks. Um, this is gonna be particularly effective against weeds which are patchy like kochia and foxtail barley, which are on the screen, as they occur in patches where crops may struggle to produce yield, in which case those patches can be mowed earlier in the season. Um, particularly with kochia, we do know that Resistant genes are able to be passed in the pollen, at least for some of the modes of action. So if we can get in earlier as this weed is starting to flower and then kill it then, it, it's gonna be better to help prevent the spread of, of herbicide resistance. So next we'll have a look at uh, residual soil applied herbicides, and I'll note some expectations for their use. I'll be focusing on two modes of action, which are group three and group 15. Both of these groups, um, envir environmental factors which influence the crop safety um, due to impacting crop vigor. So if the crop is stressed from um, cool and wet soils, or if they're poorly drained, or if there's herbicide carryover from the year before, it's it's likely going to induce um, stress on the crop, which means it's gonna be less tolerant to the herbicides being applied. So good environmental conditions are key for these to work well. So the first mode of action I wanna talk about is group three. Um, this includes anthofluralin or edge and trifluralin and these herbicides are mitotic inhibitors so they're very effective on weeds that are just emerging from the seed so they're applied to the soil surface um, and they're not very mobile in water and they create a zone of impact in the soil and typically we plant below it whereas because of our no-till systems, all of the weed seed is typically on the top where we're putting the herbicide. So ethofluralin is gonna be the example chemistry that I use, and it does have an interesting group of weeds that it is effective on, including many of the group two um, herbicide resistant weeds, including kochia, lamb's quarters, red root pigweed, as well as green foxtail, but note that there is some group three resistant green foxtail in, in the prairies, so it may not be effective on that. It also does provide some suppression of wild oat. Now, I did talk to Gowan to see um, what this meant, and they did supply this data to show, and they are getting over 70% control of wild oat with ethylfluralin and how they recommend putting it on is using a pre-seed burn down as well. And that's gonna control weeds which escape early, se early season, um, as well as um, including good 
cultural techniques in the crops uh, to promote canopy closure, and that's going to help at, at the far end. Um, Ethylflurlin in, in, in lentils is applied in the fall only. It does require a pass with the harrow to ensure it's a good contact with the soil, particularly um, in standing stubble or chaff, which is going to be pretty typical. Um, and as I mentioned, it does create a zone of impact in the soil. Um, and we're going to be planting below that, and we want to be hopefully having conditions in the environment that are going to promote the crop to push through that very quickly. Um, it's most effective on small seeded annual, so it's not going to be as effective on wild oat for that reason, because it's large seeded and able to get through that zone more easily. And that's why we want to use a pre-seed burn down herbicide application. So carryover can occur when moisture is limiting during the growing season. This is fairly common for all soil applied residual herbicides. Um, and there are some good resources by the province um, to look at the potential for carryover risk. They do put out maps of the province where they identify areas where there may be a higher risk of carryover. Um, there is a note on the label about particular um, sensitivity by wheat. So it may be a better idea uh, to go into canola and then wheat instead of going into wheat directly after, just in case you do get some carryover. Next, I'm going to be talking about group 15. Uh, these are typically called very long chain fatty acid inhibitors. I'm going to be talking about one chemistry in particular, which is peroxisulfone. Uh, again, this mode of action is applied to the soil, and it does require moisture to activate, much like group 3. Um, Weeds are going to be best controlled when they're emerging from the seed. It's going to send a premature root into the treated area. And with this herbicide, it's going to be absorbed and the plants are going to get stuck at that growth stage. They won't be able to grow, basically, as well as they have this waxy cuticle on on their leaves and roots, and this herbicide inhibits their ability to replace it, so it's not going to be able to hold moisture. So it's kind of a dual nature kill, basically. With these herbicides, and again, as a general rule for pre-emergence herbicides, um, environmental conditions should be considered, and any factor which is going to increase crop stress can increase injury. Um, I've listed, I have listed some examples on the screen, including temperature and moisture considerations. Um, I've also noted that with lentils, they are tolerant to a, a lower dose than may be applied to other crops in the prairies. So just check your label to make sure it's not going on too strong. So the first scenario I want to consider is going to be applying a paroxysulfone by itself. Um, and then we will build up with the other tank mixes in group 14 which are pretty common. Um, so when applying it alone, it will have activity on wild oat and kochia, which are two big HR targets right now, as well as the foxtails and some of our group two HR products that mm, 
there may be d difficulty controlling them with post-emergence options in the crop. So crop staging for perox perox is going to be either pre-seed or pre-emergence to the crop in the spring. As I mentioned, this herbicide is most effective on weeds as they're emerging. So weeds which are already up are not going to be controlled well. So it's best to incorporate a burn down herbicide in a tank mix as you were applying. And again, it does need moisture to activate. Um, so if you're in a scenario where you have applied this and then it's dry and then your crop emerges and your weeds come up and then it rains, it will activate, but it won't control the weeds that have already emerged. You will have to use a post-emergence herbicide to clean those up. So I'm, I had mentioned tank mixing and there are some burn down herbicide options from group 14. And this is an important group because it's gonna help us manage um, group two HR targets or herbicide resistant targets. Um, so this could be either heat complete which is cefalofensil or focus, which is carfentrazone, and both of these products can be applied pre-plant to um, pre-emergence of the crop. And I have made a few notes here that ch check your labels. There are a few warnings about tolerance based on cultivars, um, and with heat complete, there is also a warning about getting a, a bit of chlorosis um, on the crop, but it should emerge and grow out of that. So those products don't have much residual activity in the soil. Um, for this next product, it does. So it should be applied in the fall and, and that's fierce, which is Plumioxazin plus peroxisulfone, so that's group 14 and 15, and both of these do have pre-emergence activity, so they're going to be most effectively applied to, to the soil and killing weeds as they emerge. And the nice mix, or the nice control aspect with this is that you will be seeing peroxisulfone killing weeds as they're emerging, and then with Plumioxazin, as those weeds are reaching the surface, it will impede their ability to harvest light and be killed that way. So it's two distinct modes of action. This should, should be applied in the fall um, and it can be incorporated into a burn down application with a broad spectrum herbicide as well, such as glyphosate. Um, and you will be targeting perennials and winter annuals with that application and you'll want to keep dis disturbance of the soil low after you apply this herbicide. Just a reminder, Next, sorry, we've got five minutes left here. Great, thank you. Next, we'll move on to the organic options. So seeding rates are an important consideration for Cultural weed management, as higher rates can promote canopy closure. This is work by Bayard et al. in 2009 that looked at increasing organic lentil seeding rates. Um, and what the authors found was that they were able to double the rate for seeding and they did get about a 26% reduction in weed biomass and yield was still profitable above that of the lower rate, um, which was the industry standard to, to get about 130 plants per square meter. And I know there is some additional work by Steve 
shirt lift that shows that there's a lot of opportunity to to increase the rate of seating as well as to use narrower row spacing. So next um, is an example of tillage options that are used and you can look at interrow cultivation and basically here the authors are able to show that they can use a single pass and only get about 7% yield loss when it's done between the five and 10 node stage of crop development. Um, but once they start using multiple passes, yield starts to drop. And in this next study, they were able to look at integrating cultural and me mechanical control. And they didn't really find an interaction. So when they doubled or when they doubled the seeding rate, they did find that it did help decrease weed biomass by 16%. And that um, if they were going to use a single instrument, the rotary hoe gave the best control. And if they were able to use two, then the rotary hoe mixed with interrow cultivation worked the best. So I just want to come back around to this slide and end here. And that under our current control strategies, um, I am concerned that weed populations are increasing and we're going to continue to get a loss of efficacy from our herbicides. Um, so we should be, I'm hoping to encourage folks to think about controlling weeds at the end of the season and, and throughout. And options here include using physical control strategies to kill weeds, which have escape control to incorporate soil residual herbicides to control weeds as they're emerging and to use cultural techniques to encourage canopy closure after the crop has emerged. And I'll end there. Thank you for your time. Perfect. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, you've given us all a lot to think, a lot of interesting weed management strategies to think about as we head into seeding. If you have any questions for Dr. Sharp, don't forget to type them into the question box on your dashboard, and we'll address them during the Q&A discussion at the end of the session. Our next speaker is Lori Friesen, and today she'll be sharing information about the latest lentil varieties available to growers, as well as what varieties are coming down the pipeline. SPG continues to invest in breeding and variety development that will bring improved lentil varieties and traits to growers more quickly. Lori completed a Master of Science degree in Agriculture from the University of Saskatchewan. She dedicated a large part of her career to canola research in the areas of breeding, trait development, biotechnology, and genetic improvement. In 2014, she traded canola for pulse crops as a research project manager with SPG. In 2016, she accepted the role of seed program manager, where she handles variety commercialization, as well as coordinating the Saskatchewan soybean and pulse crop regional variety trials. Uh, welcome, Lori. Well, thank you, Sean. It's a pleasure to be here and, and to have the opportunity to talk about uh, lentil varieties. For some reason, my picture is really huge on the screen. I'm not sure why. It looks good on our end, Lori. Okay. <laughs> so this chart shows the relative percent acres by market class in Canada from the years 2016 to 2020. The relative number of acres seeded to the main lentil market classes has not changed much over the last five years. There were some fluctuations in 2018 with increased acres of green lentils versus red lentils. However, a more typical distribution by market class was re-established by 2020. 
And this chart shows the large green acre seeded by variety in 2020 in Saskatchewan. Among the large green lentil varieties, the non imi varieties CDC Greenland and CDC Green Star still capture the majority of the large green acres. The percentage of acres seeded to CDC Green Star has been increasing every year from 2017 to 2020. And in 2020, CDC Green Star captured 45% of the large green lentil acres. The IMI tolerant variety CDC Empower, which was released in 2009, is now on the decline, as are the other varieties that are shown on this uh, chart. There we go. So on-farm yield data from crop insurance shows why CDC Green Star has become so popular. Besides its good green color, it shows the highest on-farm yield versus its competitors. This chart shows the relative yield in pounds per acre in, in each year from 2017 to 2020. So each of the bars represents the one of each of the years. And the number that's shown on the top is the yield in 2020 in pounds per acre. So CDC Green Star is showing to be one of the highest yielding. However, there's a new variety that is expected to make an impact, and that is CDC Lima. It's just starting to capture acres. There hasn't been much seed out yet, um, but based on crop insurance on-farm data, it was the highest yielding. Now, however, we need to note that this was only based on 4,400 acres. So, you know, we need a couple more years to see if this uh, continues, but it looks promising. So this table shows four years of head-to-head -head yield data from 2017 to 2020 from the regional variety trials. Now, in this data, C to C Lima was not the highest yielding large green lentil. Uh, and in fact, yielded a little bit lower than CDC Green Star in the brown and dark brown soil zones. However, it was a little more competitive in the black and dark gray soil zones, uh, which are represented by area three and four. So, you know, it remains to be seen. Uh, sometimes yield performance data in yield trial testing doesn't always equate exactly to what happens on farm. And that's why both are an important source of information. So now this chart shows the small red acres by variety in 2020. CDC Maxim continues to dominate, uh, although the percentage of acres is steadily decreasing each year from a high of 70% in 2017 uh, down to 45% in 2020. So it's been steadily decreasing. Both of the clear field varieties, CDC Proclaim and CDC Impulse, are gaining acres each year. And now, each capture approximately 20% of the red lentil acres. Interest in CDC Red Moon is also increasing as more growers are willing to forego herbicide tolerance in favor of yield potential. Uh, typically, the, the non-clear field varieties tend to yield a little higher than the, um, the uh, clear field type. So in this case, CDC Red Moon is, is a very good variety. Now this shows the most current small red lentil varieties compared to the, to the Czech CDC Maxim. The yield data represents again, four years of head-to-head -head data from the Saskatchewan Regional Variety Trials. Now comparing the two clear field varieties uh, shown here, CDC Impulse and CDC Proclaim. Uh, CDC Impulse in this case is looking really good in comparison to CDC Proclaim. However, in talking with growers, Comparative performance varies depending on the producer. So again, it's hard to know which is better uh, for on-farm production. Uh, for both of these, there's lots of seed available. They've been out for a little while now. So among the uh, non-clear field varieties, again, CDC Red Moon has had the most traction. and seems to have the greater yield stability as it does uh, exceptionally well in both uh, areas or soil zones. The two later releases, CDC Carmine and CDC Coral, um, have good yield, but they've just ha not had as much interest among seed growers. And as such, there's no seed advertised at this time. Uh, we know that there was seed in production, so it may show up 
uh, in the next few years, but it just hasn't had the interest that CDC Red Moon had. So the new the two most recent clear field types are CDC Nimble and CDC Simi. And these have about another year before certified seed will be available. Right now there's foundation and a little bit of registered. So hopefully there'll be some certified next year. And they tend to perform very similarly in yield trial data. Now this shows the crop insurance yield data over four years for five small red varieties. Now the large number on top again represents the yield in pounds per acre in 2020 for each variety. And based on this, CDC Proclaim shows that it's maybe a bit better than CDC Impulse. Uh, so again, it might have to come down to on-farm comparisons by the producer. Um, might be a good practice to, to do a comparison on your farm. Uh, the Sorry, we have three minutes left. Okay. Uh, the column at the end is preliminary yield for the new variety CDC Simi. Uh, again, it, it's from very low acres as it's just very recent. So, but right now it looks promising. So here's a, just a quick sneak peek at one, what's on the horizon. New in 2021 with CDC Grim, which is a large green clear field variety. Now the main benefit to this was increased resistance to anthracnose. It's rated moderately resistant, which is the best rating for a lentil variety in this market class. And in talking with the breeder, Bert Vandenberg, he noted that CDC Grimm was able to withstand a severe anthracnose infestation better than the other lines in the field. So although you can see from here, it's, it's uh, not as high yielding as, as uh, Green Star, the uh, improved resistance anthracnose was the main reason for going with this one. And in the small green lentil, there is um, a new variety out there that will be coming along in the next few years and that's CDC Gemini. And this is an exciting variety because although it's a clear field variety, it actually has better yield than the top yielding non clear field variety CDC Kermit. And here again is some regional trial data. Again, uh, this is two years of head-to-head -head testing and here it yielded 113% in the brown and dark brown soil zones and 89% in the black and dark gray soil zones as compared to the Czech CDC maxim. And this represents about a 4% yield increase in the brown and dark brown soil zones over the non-ME CDC Kermit. So this one's gonna be quite exciting and one to watch out for. And uh, finally, I want to talk a little bit about large red lentils. Uh, these have been uh, traditionally marketed as the King Reds, King Red 1 and King Red 2. However, the new variety CDC Sublime was released in 2020 and it's very unique. It has a red codledon, uh, or I mean, yeah, red codledon, as you can see in this photo, but it has a green seed coat. So this, uh, and also it's exceptionally high yielding, 116% of CDC maximum in the South. So this variety is being marketed through a non-exclusive contract to ensure it's maintained in a closed loop system and that whole seed is not exported. So only dehulled or split product can be exported. This is an exceptional variety and it's important that the IP is protected. Uh, this will be one to watch out for and potentially seek out production contracts. And with that, I'd like to thank you for having me today and look forward to any questions you might have. Back to you, Sean. Thank you again, Lori, for sharing the exciting uh, variety updates coming for lentils. We look forward to these new varieties across Saskatchewan in the future. If you have variety questions for Lori, make sure to type them into the question box and we can get to them at the end of the session today. Our next speaker is Melanie Lepa and she'll be sharing information on how to manage disease in your lentil crop. We know that root rots, anthracnose, and fungicide insensitivity continue to be a problem with lentil crops, and SPG is focused on overcoming some of these production barriers through our R&D strategy and research project funding. Melanie grew up on a grain and cattle farm near Swift Current, Saskatchewan. 
She attended the University of Saskatchewan and obtained her Bachelor of Science in Agriculture, majoring in Soil Science in 1995. Melanie started her independent consulting business, Soils and Such Agronomy Limited, in 2013. She provides her customers with soil sampling, crop planning, record keeping, fertility recommendations, and crop scouting. Uh, thank you for joining us, Melanie. Great, thanks, Sean. All right, um, thank you very much for having me this morning. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak on disease management in lentils, and um, I look forward to some interesting um, conversation in the Q&A. We'll dive right in, and um, I'm gonna talk about two topics today, um, root rot risk management and also anthracnose. So um, I'm sure all of you understand um, a little bit about root rots, but we'll just do a quick overview. Um, the root rot complex is our nemesis, and it contains um, these four um, pesky guys, Aphanomyces, Fusarium, Pythium, and Rhizoctonia. And of course, Aphanomyces is the big bad guy that's really come to head in the last few years. So um, Aphanomyces is um, really hard to manage because it has a long-lived um, resting stage called an oospore and it can wait in the soil for um, the right host and the right conditions. And uh, this photo here is actually taken back in a drier year where it kind of crept up on us uh, kind of unexpectedly in a field. We hadn't seen it in the past. So um, Aphanomyces um, makes itself shown when um, there's presence of a host growing and uh, free water in the soil. They hatch into a zoospore and um, they release into soil water and they can swim which is really kind of cool and um, they can infect really quickly um, and they work away at the outer layer of the root um, and uh, can quickly do some damage. So uh, the other crazy thing about them is when their food source is gone, they easily go back to the oospore stage and wait for the cycle to start again. Um, I call Fusarium kind of a Phanomyces nasty brother or sister and um, it's, com it's common to all of our crops that we grow. Um, it's present in every field at some level um, and they tend to be together often so it's the reason why we have such um, low thresholds for Aphanomyces. If we didn't have Fusarium it might be might look a little bit different. So I think we need to look at how we're going to manage root rot into the future. Um, we need to kind of look at, we actually need to look back in time, look at how how uh, pulses have performed for us on a field by field basis now. We need to take better records, almost like starting in a Phanomyces journal, um, where you would note things like weather patterns, um, maybe crop stages when you note damage, because I know um, I intend to note damage about the same time every year, uh, shortly after herbicide, if we get a rain in there, that's a good kind of soaker. Um, and uh, South Pulse Growers put together this chart to kind of summarize weather conditions over the last few years, which is great because, I don't know, I can't seem to remember two or three years back exactly like weather patterns are, and, and I think we all need to kind of start keeping track of that data somewhat to have a bit of an idea. And if, if you've noticed, I'll, I've circled the year 2017, because if you're in a four-year rotation with pulses, that's the year you need to start thinking back to to plant in 2021. And um, in our area in 2017, we were um, quite dry and uh, below average moisture, but we had some um, short batches of rain and sure enough, we had a Phanomyces um, appear. So it's just good to have some really good records on, on how things um, were in the past and definitely how things are looking in going forward in the future. So how to manage into the future is a challenge. And um, there's some new technologies that we can use. Um, I think one of them is going to be understanding your baseline infection levels. And I'm not sure a lot of people have a really good handle on this. I know myself, I don't really either, but it can start with soil sampling, either fall or spring. And you have some options on how you wanna do it. If you wanted to do a whole field composite sample, or concentrate in areas. Personally, I'm not a big fan of the whole field composite idea. Um, I think you're gonna dilute the, the, the problem out there. I think I would target my samples in a concentrated area, like low spots or water runs or, low in yield, or lower yielding areas that I've noted in the past. Um, then you have, you have 
quite a few options of sending it to the lab. Um, SAS Pulse has put together a really good document on all the labs and, and what they do. And I highly recommend just, you know, call the labs and have them explain to you um, what their options are. But once you have a sample, you, you can either get results that are positive, negative. So yes, you have it. Uh, no, you don't. Some labs will actually do a positive, negative test, and then they can give you an indication if you have a spore load level at high enough um, to cause plant disease. And some labs can even go further to quantify the spore load. So um, that's kind of interesting. Um, there's also the option to do a soil bait test. And I like to do get my hands dirty and do stuff like this. So I think I'm going to try a soil bait test myself maybe um, next winter. And that's where you can actually take the soil samples and grow some, I would say peas because it's very visual in peas and let them grow for three or four weeks and uh, have a visual look at the leaf, at the roots after that. And um, and then later on, they can be sent to the, the lab for extraction. So um, what do the results mean when you get them back? Well, positive, negative, that's pretty straightforward. Um, quantitative results, uh, the big key thing to think about is um, research has determined um, 100 spores per gram of soil and no pulses. So that's a pretty low number. So, um, but it's good that we have something to go by at this point. And then of course the soil bait, uh, you can do it with just visual results or you could actually uh, take the roots and send them to the lab for, for an extraction to see, um, you know, which, if it's positive or negative. So I do think there are some pros and cons of doing the soil testing method. Um, for one, it's hard to decide where to test. Um, there's multiple parts of a field that can be infected. Um, ultimately, it would be great to do samples in a whole bunch of different areas to kind of get a gradient of the problem. But I realistically think that it gets expensive, you know, at 100 bucks a pop, um, it gets pretty expensive. So I'm not sure that that's realistic. And the other thing I just want to caution about, um, Shama Chatterton mentioned it this uh, winter in a few meetings, that there is a potential for false negatives in some of these tests. And it's just because they can't extract the um, uh, um, aphanomyces out of the soil. And that happens especially after drought. So they can't necessarily get that aphano to show up in the soil. It doesn't mean it's not there. It's just they couldn't see it. So is it a valuable tool? I think so. Um, I think it's fairly new and I'm not sure a lot of people have their head around how valuable it can be. But I do trust that, um, you know, going forward, um, you know, it, it will become more valuable as we get our heads around it and more people use it and more research is done. So um, I know last year there were fields that had small amounts of symptoms in 2020. And so there comes your, your little journal that you should start to, to keep and make some notes on what you saw before it, it kind of gets too fuzzy. Um, set up a rotation to try and lengthen between pulses and reduce your spore load if you can in fields where you have small amounts so you can kind of get in front of it. And then of course you've got the option to soil test for a baseline with plans to go back and test again. And um, I would, in, I would highly encourage people to GPS these sites so that when you go back in three or four years and test again, you're getting the same basic area. And I do, I honestly think, you know, um, in three, four or five years, whenever your rotation works again around to pulses, we'll maybe have a better understanding of what these soil test results say. Um, and um, maybe will help you decide what you can and can't do in, in some of these fields. Because I think the fields with the low levels of infestation are, are the challenging ones for growers. I honestly don't think um, people are going to stop growing pulses because they had a little bit of a phanomyces. They make money, they're good in rotation and, and stuff. So, um, but it's good to start getting a handle on things. So to grow or not to grow in 2021, ask yourself the question, is a phanomyces present in the past? Did it, what did it look like in 2017? What did it look like in other pulse years? Um, it's early. You could still do a spring soil sample if you really want to kind of figure that whole method out and, and um, you know, you, it gets you a little bit of an idea of what's going on. Um, go through your past cropping history. Um, the frequency of pulse and rotation has really shown that, um, you know, the more times you've had pulse in the last 20, 25 years, the increased levels of phanomyces in those fields. 
So, um, you know, if you have some choices on your pulse acres, maybe, you know, try to go to fields that have less frequency. Think about soil types um, in the fields that you do have problems in. Um, oftentimes there are heavier soils that maybe don't drain as well, so there's more free water. Another thing to think about, which I wasn't really thinking about till I put this presentation together, but was historical fusarium issues. Like I mentioned before, they kind of go together. So, you know, some fields might have heavier levels of fusarium in them and um, which comes first, the chicken or the egg, fusarium or phanomyces, it's, it's hard to say. So if you have some fields with heavy fusarium, those are ones to think about. And if you decide to go ahead and plant and kind of start your journey on trying to figure out this beast, um, dig, dig, dig. I spend most of my summer digging and looking at roots and, um, you know, send, send away your roots and get them tested. See, see, um, kind of confirm what you're seeing or what you think you're seeing out there and, and keep your journal, keep an eye on things, um, that are going on basically about a week after a moisture episode, uh, you'll start to see some, something show up if you have a phanomyces or root rot in general. So, as I mentioned before, a few things to think about, um, rotation, weather patterns in previous years, choosing the right field based on uh, texture, drainage, past issues. Um, you know, you do have time to do a soil test or start in the fall. Good quality seed always ensures a, a healthier plant. Um, there are a couple seed treatments registered, um, Intego and Rancona Trio um, for early season suppression. Um, for people who have a Phanomyces, like in this field, absolutely, those seed treatments should be used. Um, a good healthy um, nutrient system, um, good fertility um, system on your farm will definitely help. Plants that are, are healthy tend to handle stresses better. And this past year we really noticed aphanomyces show up in compacted areas. So I think we need to start getting our heads around some compaction and how to minimize it because it really rears its, aphanomyces really reared its head in compacted areas this past season. And with that, I think I'll move on to the other massive challenge we have in lentils, and that's anthracnose. And um, for me, in my area, anthracnose has been a challenge for years and years and years. I remember my first few years out even um, getting to meet anthracnose early, um, and it's kind of become the main, the main um, leaf type disease, leaf and stem disease that we deal with. Um, it is uh, stubble and dust horn, that big black combine dust cloud is often has some anthracnose in it. It's uh, very much um, a warm temperature um, disease. It develops at warm temperatures between 20 and 24 and it loves humidity. So those screaming hot days when it's warm, warm, warm and 30 above and humid, um, anthracnose is definitely at work in the bottom of your canopy if you have it. Um, often you'll see leaflet lesions appear around the 10 to 12 node stage, maybe even earlier. Um, and it seems like it can just be a matter of days and stem lesions will follow. I've often found by the time I find um, leaflet lesions, like in this photo, um, there's often some small stem lesions there already. And it's polycyclic, so it can cycle many times throughout the growing season. So it just doesn't go away after it first shows up. So much the same things to manage anthracnose as a phanomyces, crop rotation. The more you can lengthen that rotation, the more time there is for those spores to break down. Scouting is super important with anthracnose. You need to scout early um, to try and get ahead of it, and you need to scout often. Um, also, when it comes time to decide if you need to do something or not, you need to assess the level of risk, You know what the weather patterns are, what they might be in the next week and uh, moisture and, and humidity levels. You know, if we've got a wet, humid season upon us, it's definitely um, putting your level of risk higher. You need to think about fungicide timing because we all know lentil canopies are a challenge to spray. And the key, I think, is getting some fungicide in into the system, um, you know, prior to canopy closure. And then, of course, fungicide choice. And it looks like we have lots of choices. You know, there's five groups there, but um it's there's not as many as you think and i'll get on to that here in a minute or two um the elephant in the room of course is the group 11 insensitivity um it was suspected in 2019 and uh, of course tested for in 2020 to more of an extent and it's a mutation so that means all group 11 strobes and is resistant to all of them the if you have it if you have insensitivity in your fields the challenge there's no test available for us to use. We can't just send it to a lab and get results. Um, 
yet. Hopefully someday there will be. Um, and the other challenge is the distribution of insensitivity is unclear across the province and the lentil growing area. So um, we don't really know how bad it is or to what extent it is in fields and areas. So um, testing is underway. And I think a good way to look at it is approach it um, like you have it. So um, SAS Pulse put together this chart for growers and agronomists to use, and it kind of really um, makes us realize how few choices we actually have. So red is not good in a chart. So you can see the top half of the chart is all of the group 11 fungicides, and they all have a red X beside them. So those products are off the list by themselves for sure. Um, the next um, section B on the chart is the non-group 11 um, fungicides that are registered on anthracnose. And um, you can see that there are just a few choices. Actually, if you, you dive into that chart, you'll notice that um, um, the bottom four products all have the same active ingredient. Uh, Bravo and Ecto Echo have the same active ingredient. So it's really um, down to three choices out of that group. And then, of course, the bottom of this chart shows you the combination products, the multi-mode of action products that also have a group 11, as well as, as the um, group 3 and group 7 in them. And there's not a lot of choices with a, a green highlight in, in that um, part of the chart as well. So it seems like we have a lot of choices, but um, we really don't. So um, it comes down to um, do you use a group 11 or not? And it's probably a bit of a contentious issue. Um, the, the group 11s are very effective against anthracnose if, they're, if it's not resistant to it. So um, I do believe that there is uh, a portion of the population that will still be sensitive to the group 11. So I don't think it's terrible to have a group 11 in your mix, but I do think it needs to be in a multi-mode of action. Um, product. So your kind of your choices are similar if you think you have it or you suspect you have it or you don't think you have it or you suspect you have it. You should be using multi-mode of action products if you can. Um, maybe if you don't think you have it, maybe you go in with a protectant only to start. It's it's kind of going to be um, something you have to think about or maybe some combination. And then if you suspect you do, you basically have these four choices and um, you know, you have to pick where you want to be with your first app. Um, and then for sure, when you move into your second app, you have to choose from these four again, and prefer preference would be given to not the same one you used the first time to really kind of keep mixing it up. And ultimately in a perfect world where money grew on trees, we would do some form of a combination of these products, but I'm not really sure if that's realistic. Um, in, in the cost side of things, but it, it, we may get there at some point. And then if we actually had to do a third app, I think that's going to be a major challenge, not only just from a product choice standpoint, but also um, from the um, coverage issue side of things and stuff too. So I kind of threw up a couple different scenarios and um, the key thing would be to get in early as possible, early season, even before first sign of lesions, if you can, I know that doesn't always work out for a lot of guys, but as early as possible. And in scenario one, you're going down the path of putting a protectant product on first, like a Bravo or a Manzate Max. Um, these products are super thick. They're like paint um, and they do no systemic work whatsoever. So they're strictly contact. Where you paint them is where they stay and where they work. Um, and then you could follow that up with a second app um, right before canopy closure with a more of a multi-mode of action, a multi-group product. Scenario two would be the same timing, but that's when you would, could go in with your um, multi-mode of action product. And that's about the one time where you could put a group 11 multi-mode of action product in place is, is early on because there will be some sensitive population out there and hopefully we'll knock that out um, with that first round and then your second app might be an option for um, a contact type product like a Bravo or Mancazem. The, the key thing though with those products is they have very long pre-harvest intervals. So for um, Bravo, you're looking at like a 48 day pre-harvest interval. And for Mancazem, I believe it's like a 35 day 
um, pre-harvest interval. So you have to think about some timing things as well. And I just put a note up there that Cotegra was kind of a new um, registration in season last year. So it's another option, another tool in our toolbox. So um, in the world of anthracnose management, uh, research continues. It's pretty new that this insensitivity issue is pretty new. So um, there's a lot of people, you know, working on it. Um, BSF has done some sampling and some testing and hopefully are going to do some more this season. Syngenta has done some sampling and testing over the winter um, and more this season. They actually have an in Canada, um, they've been doing their testing in Canada. So that's kind of cool. Um, UPL has got some research trials in the work for this works for this season with the Mans 8 Max to you know help us get our heads around how well it works and what it can do for us and there is an industry task force in place that is you know just trying to get information out on this and work away at um, you know understanding what is happening and and hopefully we can get a better handle on kind of the distribution of um, insensitivity ac across the lentil growing area. So with that, I will finish up by saying thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, I always love doing presentations and I wish we could do it in person. It's way more fun to do a Q&A when you can see people's faces, but I look forward to some interesting um, discussion in the Q&A. Thank you. Okay, thank you again, Melanie, for sharing all of your agronomy expertise with us and for giving us some tools to help with disease management in our lentil crops. If you have questions for Melanie, make sure to submit them in the question box and we'll get to them in the Q&A at the end of today. Our next presenter this morning is Dr. Kui Liu and he is going to share his research and findings on the benefits of lentils in crop rotations, the long-term implications of shortened rotation with lentils, and some options to think of for your lentil rotations. Uh, being able to address sustainable and economic beneficial crop rotations with lentils while managing pest pressures is an important area of research investment for SPG. We want growers to have more rotation options to help extend their lentil growing capacity. Dr. Liu is a hi newly hired agronomist at the Swift Current Research and Development Centre with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. He conducted his PhD study in organic potato cropping systems that integrate perennial forages and soil amendments. He is currently leading an integrated crop agronomy cluster project across different ecozones in the Canadian prairies. Dr. Liu takes a systems approach to understanding the complex biotic and abiotic interactions in intensively managed cropping situations. Welcome, Dr. Liu. Good morning, and thank you for coming to this presentation. Uh, today, I'll talk uh, lentil crops in cereal oil seeds cropping systems. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the research team, including 15 collaborators, eight research technicians, and several graduate students on this project. And also, I'd like to thank financial support from Saskatchewan Post Growers, Master 21, Saskatchewan uh, Government, and Agriculture Agri-Food Canada. We know that our culture on the Canadian prairie faces challenges, uh, partially because of lack of diversified crop rotation. And agriculture is a big industry. Um, what kind of crop will grow, it partially depends on crop price. And also in addition, uh, the local environment, such as the rainfall or pit units, will also partially determine what crops you can grow. And crop intensification is a general trend for the modern agriculture and crop intensification caused some, some uh, concerns regarding soil health and the pest problems. And uh, current agriculture also associated with uh, higher uh, inputs, uh, such as uh, fertilizer inputs, the seeds inputs, or pesticide inputs. The higher inputs always reduce uh, uh, farmers' net incomes. And climate change is a, a general challenge everywhere. Um, crop rotation probably is a good solution to uh, some of these problems and some of these challenges. So what is a crop rotation? A crop rotation is a, it's a practice that's uh, growing different crops sequentially 
on the same piece of land. And this is very important in organic culture compared with conventional agriculture, uh, simply because in you know, organic agriculture, uh, the restriction in use uh, chemicals. But be aware that uh, for the crop selection is not randomized select crop in rotation. Uh, we need to consider the crop types and it, it's uh, the legume crops or the cereal or it's uh, uh, oil seeds. We also consider the root types is a deep roots or shallow roots and consider the residual uh, effects from the previous crops and also residual effects from the pesticides you used uh, in the previous years that might have some uh, uh, residual effects to the following crops. So in order to maximize uh, the routine benefits, we have to think about uh, these crop sequences in rotation. There are lots of benefits of, uh, of crop rotations. Here, at least several of them. Um, for example, a crop rotation could enhance resource use efficiency, such as water use efficiency or uh, nutrient use efficiency for the, the root system difference in crop system. And also it could uh, enhance uh, solar radiation use efficiency. If you use cover crop to cover the, uh, the crop, the cover the soil for a longer term, longer time. <clears throat> and also it could control pests such as weeds, disease, and insects by breaking their life cycles, uh, improve the soil structure and the nutrient status and soil microbial activities. Most importantly, uh, crop rotation could uh, enhance the biodiversity through different crop choices during the crop sequence year. And right now the intercrop become uh, interest for lots of farmers that will increase the spatial biodiversity both below and above uh, ground. So this enhanced biodiversity will stabilize the yields under climate change or stabilize uh, net incomes, although the price could be volatile. <clears throat> so overall, crop rotation is a good strategy to enhance the resilience of cropping systems to biotic and abiotic uh, stresses. Um, the key here is to know your goal of your rotations and which target you're working on and then to make sure you know what's your target in order to maximize your rotation benefits. Of course, there are some challenges uh, associated with crop rotations. For example, you need to know, you need, you need to have more knowledge and uh, experience to handle different crops in your rotations. And that's always always be a challenge. And also you probably need to invest uh, machinery equipment to seed, harvest, and spray different crops. And crop rotation are also a farm specific. Um, the same crop rotation work in your neighborhood farm doesn't mean work on your farm because your farm history may be different. Your soil may be different. So it's, it is farm specific practices. And then the next challenge is uh, you need to know uh, the right crops that are suitable for uh, your local environment and soils. And also know if there are any registered chemicals for use for new crops, <clears throat> excuse me, or the smaller equilibrium equi crops. So these chemicals, agricultural chemicals are very important to make sure uh, you have them available and uh, control uh, the pests when, when, when they become a problem. And also be prepared, probably there's a side, side effects of crop rotation that's a low uh, profits in the short term. Uh, that's uh, keep that in mind when you're planning your crop rotation. So lentil is an important crop in South Kachuan. The seeding area rain increased uh, in the last 20 years and peaked in 2016, about 2.0 million hectares and reduced the acreage because of the price drop. And currently is maintained between 1.3 to 1.5 million hectares. And about 90% of lentils in Canada are produced in South Kachuan with a farm value of about 1.2 1 
to $1.3 billion. So the lentils is super important for the semi-arid region. In the semi-arid region, the carbon system change dramatically. Uh, it starts with the fallow weeds, and then after introduce a conservation tillage, and the carbon system get more diversified, like canola and the cowseed crop are part of the diversified crop rotations. And the question is, how lentil feed in this uh, diversified carbon system uh, in semi-arid region? So we conducted experiments. Um, this experiment was conducted at three sites, uh, Lesbury, Scott, and Surreal Current is a crop rotation study. In year one, we have a fellow, a chemical fellow, lentil and uh, wheat to, cre to create different stubbles. And year two is uh, oil seeds, including canola, mustards, and camellia. Year three is a wheat. So year two, year three are typical uh, oil seeds, cereal rotation. So here are the key results. We found that in year three, during wheat year, and the, the lentil stubble increased the yields by 17% compared with fellow. Fellow is good, maybe it's only good to the following year and not so good the year after. But lentil stubbles is quite different because the residual lentil could produce uh, could produce more uh, nitrogen for the uh, following several years, several years of crop uh, during the uh, decomposition of uh, lentil crops. So this is uh, the crop phase level at the wheat, uh, durum wheat uh, phase. And at the carbon system level, I use uh, durum wheat including yield, which is uh, calculated to use the price of crops and the yield of the price, a uh, yield of the crop. So the result here is very clear compared with uh, the fellow, it's uh, red. The lentil stubble uh, is uh, green, is significantly higher uh, system production. Even for compare with uh, the wheat stubble is green and then lentil stubble produce either similar or significantly higher system production. So this study indicated that uh, lentil crop uh, could uh, be a substitute for fallows and also um, other uh, pulse crops such as chickpea or um, P and may also uh, suitable for this suitable in this uh, cereal oil seeds crop rotation. So the question is, uh, um, how lentil affect crop system compared with P and chickpea, and uh, how the lentil intensification uh, affect crop system, and uh, how crop diversification affect the lentil wheat dominant crop system. To answer all these questions. Uh, we have we did another experiment. Uh, this is another uh, rotation experiment. It's a four-year rotation. is conducted at super current at two sites, and Brooks, Alberta, uh, at one site. Uh, this is a four-year rotation, and then we finished the second rotation cycle, and we have uh, 14 uh, crop rotations. So the pulse uh, frequency ranges from zero to three years in four-year rotation. And also we include uh, the diversified crop rotations. And this study have five crops in total. We have a chickpea, have lentil, have pea, has mustards, and have wheat. So I think the question you may ask first is uh, how this economic performance among these uh, 14 crop rotations. Um, here's the economic uh, returns across 80 year study period. We found here every rotation, if they have the lentil inside, and then they will produce a positive uh, net uh, revenues. And the higher lentils will produce a higher net incomes. The highest is uh, rotation 12 is lentil, lentil, lentil wheat is this uh, treatment. Of course, this is, not, this is not the rotation I recommended. Uh, this high net income partially because of high lentil price during the study year. And also uh, this is a research farm, uh, research, this is a plot scale uh, research. And we uh, monitor the disease or weeds or insects 
uh, very carefully, very closely with, with Scott, probably every other days, and we apply more uh, pesticides than the average producer do. Uh, so uh, if the producer and you will adopt this rotation problem, this rotation you may face disaster results because of disease or other problem. So this is not the rotation I recommended. Uh, the exciting thing is these two rotation, they are diversified rotation, they have a lentil involved, and also they, they, they produce, uh, generate uh, decent uh, economic returns. So we know that Economic return is just one indicator of carbon system. We may interest in uh, looking into how different crop rotations affect production and soil health, resource use efficiency, and environmental impact. So for today's presentation, I use three different groups of rotations to see how different pulse crops, how lentil frequency, how crop diversification affects this economic, uh, sorry, this uh, agronomic and soil health resource yield efficiency. For the pulse types, I select four rotations is wheat monoculture and pea wheat, uh, chickpea wheat and lentil wheat. So here is the results. Uh, this uh, green is uh, pea and uh, blue is a lentil. So P and lentil, this rotation, produce a higher yield for the wheat in year two, four, and six, and eight. It's because of uh, the benefits of uh, nitrogen benefits, and also both lentil and P, they have a relatively shallow roots and they conserve the soil in the deep soil. So that could be used by, by wheat. So that's very important for the highland, for the dryland or same area region. In comparison, chickpea has a longer uh, root system and also they have a longer uh, duration, a uh, growth, growth uh, duration that may, comp comp that may deplete uh, soil, uh, your soil profile. And then pressure will explain why uh, chickpea uh, some year they perform uh, lower than the wheat monoculture in terms of wheat yield. So at cropping system level and across the uh, eight years, I use a uh, uh, protein yield to compare the, these four different rotations. Similarly, pea wheat and uh, lentil wheat has a higher system um, production. So this is a nitrogen. I determined the mineral nitrogen at the second year and end of the first rotation and end of the uh, uh, the rotation of the second second uh, rotation year, we found these three pulse rotations produce a similar nitrogen benefits at the three selected years, and uh, all of them are higher than the, the wheat monoculture. But the main benefits is uh, in the soil surface layer, and this is true because this study was conducted at no-till uh, practices. For environmental impacts, we determine greenhouse gas emission and two emission here, we, we measured. We see here these three uh, pulse width uh, rotation reduce the greenhouse gas emission and two emissions compared with the monoculture. And then these three pulse crop rotation uh, produce a similar effects. So this results, this uh, uh, the different pulse crop study uh, indicated that uh, the lentil produces similar effects as other two uh, pulse crops. Uh, remember at the beginning we said lentil crop might uh, produce more, generate more uh, net uh, uh, returns. So is that possible? Is that okay if we increase the lentil frequency in crop rotation? So here I, to answer that question, I select three different rotations. Uh, this is a uh, uh, have one year uh, lentil in four year rotation. This has two year lentils, it has three year lentils. We found at weight crop phase at year four and year eight. So the weight yield are quite similar. This is understandable because uh, prior to the wheat we have all every rotation has a lentil uh, crop. At the system level um, I across eight years 
uh, I use a protein yield to compare the, 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 the system production. We found that when you increase the lentil frequency in rotation, you see uh, system production drops. So that indicated that some uh, negative effects of uh, increasing frequency of lentils in rotation. And also, this is, this is for the wheat uh, biomass. We collect wheat biomass uh, uh, close to the harvest stage. And generally, uh, wheat biomass is pretty low in this uh, trial because we have a very good uh, technical support team and manage these plots very well. And here results, you can see this uh, high frequency lentil and then they has a much higher uh, wheat biomass. And that's also negative uh, consequences of uh, increase uh, the lentil frequency in rotation. And this is a stroke carbon uh, input. And stroke carbon input might be re might related to uh, the soil health. And we say when you increase the lentil frequency in rotation, you reduce the stroke carbon input uh, because of the uh, lower residual from a lentil crop. So this a lentil frequency study uh, indicated that indicated the negative effects when you increase uh, lentil frequency in rotation, uh, so that uh, high lentil frequency in, in rotation is not a good idea for uh, sustainability uh, development. And then it's implied that uh, increase the crop diversification may be the right direction uh, to go for crop rotation. Just a reminder, Dr. Liu, we have five minutes left. Okay, thank you. Um, so this uh, move to uh, move on to my uh, next uh, group of uh, rotation to see how crop rotation affects uh, uh, the agronomy uh, uh, properties. This time I select another four different rotations: is a wheat monoculture and uh, lentil wheat uh, pulse wheat, lentil wheat, and the pulse monster lentil wheat. So we have one year, two year, three year, and a four year, uh, four different crops in the rotation. So for stroke carbon input, we found that uh, this uh, uh, wheat monoculture, they increase, uh, they have highest stroke carbon, but the lowest uh, organic, soil organic carbon, because soil organic carbon is not only affected by Quality, the quantity of straw, but also affected by the quality of the straw, and also affected by the, your initial soil uh, carbon levels, your climate, and also your microbial uh, activities. And for this diverse rotation, you have pulse crops, and then the residuals have higher quality, have higher nitrogen. That might might uh, accelerate the carbon um, stabilization um, from the straw, and then you have uh, the carbon sequestration. So for nitrogen, and then I use the nitrogen balance. So we say in the monoculture, have a large balance compared with uh, the lentil wheat uh, crop rotation with different uh, crop diversification. But uh, the soil mineral in, is lower in uh, monoculture wheat. Uh, because in other rotations, they have the pulse crop in rotation, the crop residue uh, may reduce certain amounts of nitrogen during the decomposition and increase uh, the nitrogen level, particularly in the uh, surface level because uh, we conduct experiments under no-tail system. So this uh, is a crop diversification. At the wheat phase, we saw uh, this most diversified rotation is the most stable as indicated by the lower uh, variation. At the carbon system level, we found uh, this three rotation, three crop rotation is the most stable. And uh, here, the most, the, the four crop rota rotation uh, have a little bit higher uh, uh, variation is expected. The reason is in this rotation, uh, the master crop doesn't perform well and then reduce the yield level and then increase the variation. So I, in order to assess the carbon system uh, performance, I use multiple variables, including wheat yield, uh, nitrogen use efficiency, water use efficiency, 
energy productivity and re net uh, returns and uh, carbon footprint. Uh, carbon footprint is for environmental impact. So we see clear when you increase uh, your diversity, you have all the benefits you get. It's only uh, for the wheat phase. At the carbon system level, and then the little bit difference, when you increase the diversification, you uh, increase the yield, nitrogen, and water use efficiency. But for the, for the net returns, you see a little bit different. And then this uh, lentil wheat, lentil wheat is uh, less diversified, but it produces a higher yield. So what does it mean? They mean the crop rotation, they couldn't achieve all the benefits. There are some side effects, side effects we have to uh, dealing with it. So this led to my uh, take home message. Um, I think crop rotation should be considered as a long-term investment, and then they should have the short-term economic drawbacks sometimes, but you gain long-term benefits such as soil health, like resource use efficiency, and uh, environmental impacts. And it's very important to know your purpose of rotation, and then you adopt and you take to management practices to achieve the balance of uh, uh, agronomy, uh, productivity, and environment and economic returns. And one safe way to, to uh, make your rotation more sustainable is to go uh, diversify your crop rotations. And that's the key for today's presentation. Uh, that's all my presentation and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you for your presentation and research expertise related to lentils and crop rotation, Dr. Liu. We definitely appreciate the work you're doing. I'm now going to open up our live Q&A panel discussion. I'd like to welcome Shannon Chant, Crops Extension Specialist with the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture, who's joining our panel as well as all of our presenters. Just a reminder, if you have any questions, please type them in the question box on your dashboard and Sherilyn Phelps will direct them to the panelists. The Q&A is all yours now, Sherilyn. Thank you. Um, so I guess we have a number of questions that have come in and I will still be monitoring questions, so please keep entering them in that question panel box. So I'm gonna start with a question for our agronomists, give a few of the presenters a little bit of a, a break. So the first question re revolves around disease and is regarding anthracnose and ascochyta. So what are we really seeing for ascochyta and anthracnose in lentils in Saskatchewan? Are they both still a big problem or is one more severe than the other one? Shannon, I'm gonna put you on the spot first since you haven't had a chance to talk yet today. Okay, good morning, can everyone hear me? Okay, good. Um, thank you, and thank you for inviting me to be a part today. Um, we do annual surveys uh, as the province, uh, a lot of provinces do them as well. But just looking at uh, the prevalence of plant disease, so this is the percentage of lentil crops surveyed that had disease. Um, for 2019 and for 2020, anthracnose was number one both years. So it was the highest of any of the diseases, and that includes root rot, ascochyta, sclerotinia, botrytis, and stemphilium. And then looking at ascochyta, ascochyta was actually number two in 2020 um, and a bit lower um, in 2019. So I'd say anthracnose definitely kind of would be the number one. Ascochyta not as much, but it is definitely still there. Um, if you just look at Southwest Saskatchewan for anthracnose uh, prevalence, again, 2018, 2019, 2020, it's the number one. And then for ascochyta, 2019 and 2020, it's the number two by prevalence. So um, definitely high. And then if you look at incidence, which is the percentage of plants within the fields that are surveyed, um, it's been increasing for in Saskatchewan, it's 44% in 2020, and it was 37 in 2019 and 26% in 2018. So definitely increasing. Um, Overall for Saskatchewan last year, Ascochyta was number two as well. So definitely kind of the top two um, in there. Thanks, Shannon. 
Mel is an agronomist out in the field. What what are you seeing and what is, you know, sort of what you're thinking in terms of the major concerns between those two diseases? I would agree. Um, I I definitely see um, anthracnose almost every single year in some portion of the fields. And um, to be honest, I'm not seeing a whole lot of Ascochyta anymore. There's there, it's there in small amounts, but um, anthracnose seems to be kind of the thing taking over. And, and then if we've got anthracnose, often it's followed by sclerotinia to some extent in there, and it gets hard to tell exactly why that plant is rotting sort of thing. So I think on a similar note, I'm going to bring Lori into the, the discussion here on diseases, is anthracnose, and we've seen one of the varieties that had higher levels of resistance, and Mel, you talked about insensitivity in anthracnose and trying to manage that. So is the, the variety, if we can, um, you know, the incorporation of higher levels of resistance, is it translating to improved resistance in the field? Well, that's... Uh, the fairly new actually because the variety a uh, couple of the varieties that show improved resistance are really uh, new they haven't actually been grown on farm uh, the one thing that was noted though uh, was when uh, Bert the breeder for the the CDC Grimm um, could really see it in the field trial he had a severe infestation in one one of his trials and that one was uh, handling it much better so I would say that, you know, it's maybe forecasting what might happen on farm, but, uh, you know, until we see this in, in field scale production, it's kind of hard to say. So possibly one tool in the future to add to our list of items to help manage the anthracnose insensitivity. Um, there was one comment that came in here regarding the table um, that Mel presented with the red and the green and the yellow highlights on there in that um, Delaro is being supported for control of insensitive and sensitive anthracnose now. So um, just we'll be making a change to that chart once we get the data on that. So let's move on to another topic. Let's go to weeds. Um, and then we'll bring Sean into this discussion. So when we look at some of the weed issues in Saskatchewan, obviously kochia ranks right up there as one of our, our top problems in, in, um, in lentils. Can uh, you and uh, the agronomist provide us with a bit of a background on sort of the biology of kochia, why it's such a problem and how we can use that to control it? So kind of a high level from, you know, I guess the agronomist and what you're seeing out there in the field, the real issues with the kochia and, and how you're managing it. And then Sean, if you can add to that at the end. So we'll, we'll start with Shannon again. Sure, um, but definitely kochia has been an issue the last few years. Um, it has a very wide germination range, so it can germinate from two degrees Celsius for in soil temperature all the way up to 40. Um, most of it is kind of mid-April to early May, but it can be in June. But since seeding around here sometimes starts mid-April, late April, you might be missing some of it when you're kind of going with your seeding. And because it can go a bit later, you may also be missing it with in-crop as well. Um, so it's definitely something, and you know, sometimes you see further herbicide resistance, you'll go drive around and you'll see kind of the, the kochia that are still green and the trail across. There's a picture of that earlier, just across the, across the field and you can kind of go, okay, yeah, this is not so good. Um, but there are some people thinking about, you know, strategic tillage was what I'd like to call it. Don't till everything, but if you can get rid of the, that stripe or that line, uh, we've even at some point, if you if you have time or if you can, pulling some of the ones that survive um, just to get rid of those um, and then kind of bag them and throw them out too so you're not having uh, that that issue again. Um, but yeah, just do whatever you can to not have them set seed. Thanks, Shannon. Mel, would you like to add to that and your experience with kosha? Sure. Yeah, kochia is a major challenge in lentils, especially in maybe saline ground. And um, I think it, the residual herbicides are a bit of a challenge too, because we don't always get the right amount of moisture to activate them. 
And um, so we have kosher kind of sneaking through here and there. And then our in-crop options realistically do nothing for kosher. So if it escapes that initial, um, you know, run at it with like a pre-emerge um, or the burn-off or it comes after burn-off and the pre-emerge isn't working as strongly as it should be, um, you're in for a real challenge when it gets to be, you know, three feet tall and you're trying to manage it at pre-harvest. And we definitely saw that this year, you know, um, with the super hot conditions, kosher is just so resilient. It was just a nightmare to get it to dry down. And in some cases it sat out there for over a month and um, didn't really ever die. It just got pushed through the combine. So yeah, it's a major challenge and it's actually making some growers question whether or not they should be growing lentils and unless we can find some better ways to manage it. So and it may actually challenge their thinking on what they want to do to manage it too. Thank you. Sean, would you like to add to that? You know, you talked about all the different sort of herbicide options and mechanical controls and stuff like that. And what do you see as the key for kosher management going forward? I think the key for kosher management is going to be staying on top of it. Um, it's highly adaptable um, as far as a plant goes to our environments where it's growing. Um, so, I have a greenhouse full of kosher right now. Um, I am I am screening for screening it for group nine um, resistance. So if you are looking to allow it to emerge and then burn it down, don't use group nine. That's not going to work well. Um, probably a, a group fourteen is where you will get the most efficacy. Um, so either like heat or aim, for example, or the pyroflufen is another. Um, Pre-emergence herbicides are also going to work well, but um, part of the problem with kosher is that it's allelopathic. So it's producing a toxic compound that will actually stunt itself as well as stunt the crops. So crop competition with it um, becomes harder. So once you get into these patches, um, if it's quite established, it's gonna be hard for the crop to grow. Um, so it it might be better in, in those patches just to go in and, and mow it down or seed a grass, for example, like uh, AC Saltlander. Apologies, um, is a good option just to kind of move that system away from highly disturbed areas where it's able to grow. Does that make sense? Yep. Thank you. So, you know, going going on the, the topic of some of the, you know, tools that we use for koshas, residual herbicides, and there's a question out of the southeast part of the province, and I think this almost applies to a lot of the southern part of the province where moisture was minimal last year and dry right now. Um, is there any concern for these fields that have received pyroxysulfone or focus last spring before lentils and are looking at going into canola this year? And I guess kind of the same question goes for going into lentils this year is there herbicide concerns or recropping restrictions we should be watching for? So I guess the first question, is there concerns with, uh, you know, seeding canola on some of the lentil land that had pyroxysulfone or focus or other residual herbicides? I think in in general, yes, I, I would be concerned to maybe just do a test strip or a bioassay in the soils just to test to see if there's enough breakdown versus, um, or if there's gonna be enough herbicide there that is gonna cause you issues. Um, I would say definitely follow up with an agronomist or a chemical rep just to ensure that if there's any differences in tolerance based on cultivars I don't quite know off the top of my head I'd have to look it up but um, I would definitely if you are concerned um, I would check with a, a local 
agronomist or a chemical rep for sure. So Sh Shannon, would you like to comment on, I know Saskatchewan agriculture produces a risk of, of herbicide carryover kind of every year. And, and um, would you like to comment on what that map might be showing this year? Yeah, sure. Um, we collect um, kind of or map the rainfall from about June 2nd to the end of August um, and also June 16th to the to mid September just to see uh, what things are looking like um, for the carryover risk for 2020 wasn't too bad. Uh, but the carryover risk for this year is is pretty high. Um, there's concern if there's less than about five inches of rainfall during that time. Uh, and the kind of the more the spots that are showing up as a bit more higher risk, um, kind of Maple Creek area and a bit north and south, um, Gull Lake, Admiral, Gravelberg, Hodgeville south, there's a spot around Moose Jaw, a uh, bit around Indian Head, um, as well as Ituna. And then if you change that um, to the June 16th to September 14th, then there's a few more spots that are a bit higher that actually get into the extreme risk. So that's kind of around Maple Creek, kind of console area, Admiral area, but there also is some very high risk there as well. And those maps are available on our website if you wanna have a look. Um, it is just your generalization though. So if you have your own on-farm data, that's more valuable for that precipitation because it's just a generalization. And no, thanks, Shannon. And, and to, to, you know, um, also feed into that we do have a recropping restriction fact sheet that we've developed for pulses so to look at herbicides that you might be concerned with with planting lentils on it 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 gives you an indication of what the safety is and also planting other crops after a pulse crop it gives you that table as well so you can find that on our website so i'm going to shift gears here a bit and, and go to dr lou um, with your talk on pre your presentation on rotations and thank you for that your uh, presentation showed that in the, in the eight-year rotation work that it was very highly profitable for the short rotations of lentils, lentils, wheat, or lentils, wheat, lentils, wheat every second year. How do we get more buy-in from growers for expanding lentil rotations when economics really take over? You did show some data on carbon inputs and other things. Is there is there um, in the future, are, are some of these other aspects going to become more important that will help us get back to more diversified rotations? Yeah, it's, it, I, as I mentioned in the rotation that um, this is like a farm, like a research scale study and our research farm is probably has a better soil fertility and uh, everything others compared with the normal farms. And we do apply lots of pesticides. Um, sometimes it makes this uh, disease outbreak later compared with a with real farm uh, situation. Uh, I do think, you know, if there are any possibility to, to advance this stud more study on the farm scale study, that will be helpful a lot uh, for, to justify uh, the benefits of uh, Diversified crop rotation, and then as you mentioned, I also mentioned some like a weeds issue in the, and also carbon inputs, and also uh, system productivity. I, the key is you think about the cropping system. The number one we should focus on what's your the, your production, because uh, the economic sides the, the price could go up, could go down, and then some some year you may get, for example, in that. Eight year study, we, we, the results show lentil, the very profitable. But currently, the lentil price, like uh, last couple of years, lentil price dropped quite a lot. We use the same data, apply, uh, use uh, the new price, and that could change the results. Um, I do think uh, uh, we need to, to, uh, uh, to, div to divert, uh, divert, diversify a more uh, diversified rotation. And just now you mentioned about the disease, uh, like the, the weeds control. Another thing I'm thinking of, like a winter wheat or cover crop, is that an option to control like uh, the resistant kochia. And then that may be at the benefits of uh, crop diverse, diversification. So this is like a system uh, approach. We have some uh, economic 
uh, challenges uh, when we apply for the diversified composition, but you could later later on you gain the the, the benefits in soil health and resource use efficiency. That's say, the long term uh, strategy, not your short term strategy. If you farm for the next 50 years, you just think about your your long term goal rather than um, the, your short term uh, short term goals. I think. And that makes sense. It's about the long term sustainability, right? Not just the short term gains, but it's hard to ignore those short term gains. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Uh, Mel, I have a question for you. Um, if you see some early signs of anthracnose at the beginning of flowering, is it too late to spray or still okay? And is it best to spray before any lesions at the 10 to 12 node stage as a preventative measure? So, um, yeah, I would say um, even if you see some at early flower, it's worth getting in there and spraying um, because you're ho I'm hoping that you've scouted fairly thoroughly and you've it's maybe just contained to certain areas. That's what I tend to see is um, it's really concentrated in areas of the field. So my goal, if that's when I find it, would be to kind of start protecting the rest of the field and, um, you know, just setting the expectation level that the grower will see some ugly spots maybe in that field because um you're a little bit late maybe in the application and uh, ultimately in a perfect world we would get in there early before we see any any symptoms i just i've been at it a long time and it's it's a struggle to get in there timely i might be there timely but sometimes the grower can't be there timely or maybe i'm a couple days late and then it's you know panic let's get rolling and stuff but i mean ultimately if um you could get in early and um protect that's the ultimate way to manage um fungal diseases absolutely okay Thank you. And I think at that, that will be the last question that we can entertain at this time. We're getting near the end of our time. So I'm going to turn it back to our moderator. Thank you guys so much for all your questions and answers and, and your presentations. Um. Thanks again for everyone for their questions and to our panelists and presenters for their presentations and expertise today. Thank you again to Bear Crop Science for sponsoring today's session. The presentations will be made available on SPG's website. You'll receive an email on how to access them. This wraps up the Premier Pulse virtual sessions for 2021. We appreciate that you have followed these sessions each week and that you have provided us with feedback along the way. We would like to thank all of our presenters, panelists, board and staff for the work they put into these sessions. Thank you for joining us everyone and have a great day.